I'm going to move on now to the next section, which is the Practice Development Committee uh, of APSA. Uh, we explained what this was last year, but I'm going to explain again. So APSA, we are very proud to have a, as a partner of the uh, annual update course. And the, what, uh, what APSA is providing is a review of what are the biggest knowledge gaps. And uh, we have Dr. Liz Byerly from Alabama, Dr. Stephen Lee from UCLA, and Dr. Salim Islam from University of Florida. Uh, who are going to review this year's most important knowledge gaps. Did I summarize what PDC was adequately, or do you want to make a couple more comments? Did I say it? Is that ac accurate? Okay. So I think, Liz, you're starting off. Are you starting off with antibiotic stewardship? Okay. Okay. So I have this set up as a, as a case vignette and then question. Perfect. So we'll start out with the vignette. Um, you have a full-term infant who was prenatally diagnosed with an omphalocele and underwent an, um, an elective delivery without uh, any problems. There was no maternal history of fever or chorioamnionitis. And on exam, the baby is stable. There's no respiratory distress. The omphalocele is intact and covered. Um, you plan to do an abdominal wall closure in a couple of days after the workup for associated anomalies is completed. And the question is, assuming there are no signs of infection, the most appropriate antibiotic management of this patient should consist of? So what uh, the PDC would like to advocate and what the data would indicate is that um, preoperative antibiotic given one hour before incision and discontinued within 72 hours uh, is uh, the, the most appropriate answer. Okay. Given one hour before incision. So... Within, within one, one hour. hour, yes. So when do you usually give it? Uh, we usually give it when the baby arrives in the operating room. And the reason that we do that is because <clears throat> if we order it preoperatively, we have no, I mean, y'all have the same kind of schedule as we do. You never know when this kid's going to get to the OR, right? You could have a gunshot window, the admin exactly. show up or, you know, it takes them two hours to turn your room over or whatever. So we give it when the baby arrives in the operating room. In the pre-op area it, or in the OR. Actually. Correct. Sweet. Yes. Okay. Um, does anyone give it uh, do, like after around the time of timeout right before the operation or does everyone give it right when the baby arrives? I was gonna, one of, one of the points about this is that what, the baby doesn't need antibiotics just because they showed up in the NICU. I think that there's a feeling that, you know, the baby's in the NICU, they have an seal, they need antibiotics. And I think the point of the PDC, correct me if I'm wrong, Liz, is that that baby doesn't need antibiotics until they go to the OR, and all they need is standard prophylactic antibiotics. Correct. That's the whole point of yeah. this vignette in this scenario is um, we are probably using too much, too many antibiotics in children that don't actually need them, especially neonates. And, um, you know, some of, the, some of the evidence that we have on the next slide would say that um, based on um, the recommendations for the AAP and for neonatology is that um, as long as the baby is well and the mother has no signs of sepsis or choreo, you don't need to give antibiotics for children that don't have an open abdomen. So this obviously, ruptured on phalliceal gastroschisis, those are a different ball game. Those children basically have an open abdomen and you probably should give them antibiotics. But, um, you know, children that have even duodenal atresia, they probably don't need antibiotics if they're going to the operating room within the next 24 to 48 hours. What do you, what do, you do with patients that you don't bring to the operating room with emphalocils that you just paint and wait? We just do, paint and wait. No antibiotics. As long as the mom didn't have choreo, as long as the baby doesn't have a fever, we just paint and wait. Mm -hmm. Great. The, the problem is that the, 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 in our face, in our facility, these, the neonatology folks will probably start antibiotics on them. And uh, they'll, and I don't know what the role of measuring inflammatory markers are in that situation either. So especially in a post-op baby, they measure inflammatory markers like CRP or now um, procalcitonin. And because they're elevated, they will go ahead and start empiric antibiotic therapy on them. So what should we do on that? Well, I guess, you know, you take a baby to the operating room, their inflammatory markers are going to go up. And I don't know, you know, perhaps we should base this on data. And, um, you know, maybe, you, we, maybe, we, maybe we need a randomized trial to look at 
how actually these inflammatory markers are, you know, what effect they have on the use of antibiotics or on whether or not we need antibiotics. No, that's a great idea for a study. Well, just a, a comment about uh, we've got the AAP telling us to cut back on our opioids. And it sounds like the surgeons are telling neonatologists they need to cut back on antibiotics. How does the AAP help us with that? That's a great question. Um, I think antibiotic stewardship is something that's uh, coming up. It's uh, one of those hot topics, that, uh, which is why the uh, PDC felt that it was important enough to bring to the fore. Um, I think that uh, we've discussed it at uh, previous occasions when we've had a combined neonatology um, pediatric surgery conference at the AAP. Perhaps it should be brought up again. Is this unique to the neonatologist in particular? Because I know in my place there are loud pediatrician advocates for antibiotic stewardship and their whole programs and committees and all that. Is this something neat, unique to the NICU? I would say at, at our institution, uh, we have loud advocates both on both sides from surgery and, and our pediatric colleagues, and they are actually helping lead the cause of actually accusing us of giving too much antibiotics as well for patients with tracheoesophageal fistulas, gastroschisis, and so forth. And I think the best pathway for that is really multidisciplinary conferences and, and um, pathways that we've developed. So that's what we've developed at our institutions for abdominal wall defects and, and so forth and, and addresses those issues. So nobody, we, we keep each other in, in line for that. But I think they are our most powerful advocates is to get everybody on the same page. Yeah, I think that's a great point to um, engage your colleagues in the pediatricians and the NICU and the PICU and try to come up with protocols and pathways to really streamline things. And have adherence to those pathways. So, 